to our hearts, to our lives, to our circumstances, Jesus, so that our, our paths can be directed in, in the best ways, which are your ways. So I thank you for these things we can ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It says that if anyone does not provide for his own house, especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In our, in our study so far through the book of Timothy, uh, we again, just a quick overview of look through um, Paul teaching this young um, pastor that he's left over the, the church at Ephesus to discern between true doctrine and false doctrine and false teachers and true teachers and, and shared with them uh, about church offices and for the elders and the leaders and how they should rule their own house and their own lives before they can do that of the church and be entrusted with that of the church. And, and the last time as we were speaking on 1 Timothy chapter 4, he's talking about how God has, um, has desired that we take uh, heed to our own selves and our own lives and to the teachings uh, so we ourselves can be saved and those that we are communicating things to, that they be the things of God so that our hearers and those in our sphere can also be saved. And, and I'm going to pick up in 1 Timothy chapter 3 uh, with those final instructions before we move to 1 Timothy chapter 4. So if you open up your Bible, for those of you that are not there yet, um, it's going to be 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 12. Because it just flows into the next chapter. It says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers, in your word, and conduct, and love, and spirit, and faith, and purity. Till I come, give attention to the reading, to the exhortation, and to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. And meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourselves and those who hear you. So again, Paul, Paul's commission to Timothy, you must grow, you must watch yourself, you must... Um, Watch, watch that so that those around you can be saved and yourself. And as he moves on, as Timothy is a young young leader, we don't know how old he is, but in the scriptures, the, the priests, uh, when, when the sanctuary service was established in the scriptures, they could start serving in the sanctuary at age 30. So is he age 30? I don't know. Maybe he is, and he's just at the lower end, because the priests would serve until they were 60 years old. So you worked your 30 years, and then you were retired um, from that part of the ministry as far as the sanctuary service was completed. Um, how long the apostles carried on to what age, in actuality, when most of them were killed, um, that's another story. So Timothy is somewhere between 30 and 60, and... Um, and so Paul's given him, as we move to chapter 5, just additional insights in, in navigating the body of Christ. And, and so he lets him know that even though you're young, in the treatment of the family of God, don't rebuke an older man. Honor is such a powerful thing. Um, honoring the older um, men, in the, especially in the Eastern cultures. And he um, says, but exhort him or encourage him as a father. The younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with all purity. So as we look to the body of Christ and how we honor one another with our conduct and with our conversations and with our motives of interactions. And, and just because he's going to encounter all, all of those and, and how to navigate the situation. And I was thinking when he talks about honoring the older men, the Bible commands us to honor our father and our mother. Um, in the Lord, and and but also how how it makes it easy in other cultures. I think more of the Asian cultures where I personally, with the Filipinos, appreciate where I might not have to remember their name because I can just call them Auntie or Uncle, Ate or Kuya, and so everybody older than me is Ate or Kuya, and um, so just getting those levels of respect, their levels of honor. I remember one of my classmates in one of my hospital chaplaincy classes. He had been a pastor, and he's come over to America now and having to learn how to navigate the culture here. And just because you, he grew up with more of that honor system, I need to honor my elders, I need to honor those that are above me in, in leadership. And um, even and so watching him in some of the situations we were facing that were not 
as much honoring God, him having to navigate but they're my leader, how do I navigate that one? But still being like, but they're my the leader, the teacher, so I can't really disagree with it. And and so I need to just kind of follow along. But so just just looking at because I think it's such a different way than our American culture is for those that grow up in America more. Um, but still having to learn the ways of honor and and um, and how important that is in treating each one one with honor. And so as Timothy encounters again more wisdom on how to take care of the widows, because in the book of Acts, the elders have been appointed to take care of the widows and to serve the tables and to serve the body of Christ. And and here Timothy is facing a distinguishing because there's a bunch of widows apparently and so we're going to read about these widows and the light that is given and how to decide who to take care of and how so read with me in verse 3 um, through 15 and it says honor widows who are really widows but if any widow has children or grandchildren let them learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents for this is good and acceptable for God now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. And not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the feet of the saints, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire the younger widows to marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity for the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. And if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened that it may be, relieve those who are really widows. God's command is for us to first take care of our own family, and then the church, as the greater family, can step in for those that are really in need. Um, some of those qualifications, so I just look at it in the light that it shows us the literal instructions and the more parables of how that associates with today. Um, because the tale of two types of widows, those who are really widows and those who still need to grow. Um, and that's kind of the distinguishing marker. In the, okay, yeah. I was watching, um, I think, I'm not on Facebook, haven't been on that for a while, but when I was uh, like a year and a half ago, somebody had sent me this, YouTube video, and it was of this young man and um, an older lady, and all it shows, it's a short clip on inviting somebody to church, and this young man pulls up with his car, with this, with the tinted shades of, of the windows, and rolls down this window, and all you hear is this blasting, bumping, thumping music going on, and out the window as he looks, and he's moving to the music, and and he looks at the elderly woman sitting on the porch and he, he's like, yo, Miss Adams! And, and she just looks at him and goes back to what she's doing. He's like, yo, Miss Adams, I know you can hear me. Do you want to go to church today? And the music's bumping and thumping and he's just going and moving with it. And, and finally, he keeps calling out to her and he's like, yo, Miss Adams, I know you can hear me. Can you turn down that music? And so all along, it's her music that's bumping and thumping, and she finally turns it down. And she's like, what do you want? It's like, Miss Adams, we got great music at my church. It may not be like yours, but we still have hot music at my church. Can I give you a ride to church? 
church today, and she just looks down and at her Bible that's on her lap, and she's like, I suppose. So she gets up, he gets out of the car, walks up the stairs, and, and gets her, so you have him, and then this little, short, little old lady walking next to him, and it gets her in the car, opens the door, closes it, they get in to go to church, and he's like, all right, well, I'll even let you pick the music. And so the music that goes on as the windows roll up is bumping, thumping music, and he's like, all right, Miss Adams, whatever you want. And they pull up to the church. He's like, well, we're here. Now we're here. Let's go to church. But in, in the instructions for how to care for widows and, and how to take care of that which is important to God, um, the distinctions that he makes here, I think, are really powerful because it's a lifestyle that has taken place over time of patterns of behaviors and postures of heart toward God and his people. As we look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and, and the, the witness test, we'll just say, for the widows, he says, those that are left alone and trust in God and pray. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been in a position where you are all alone. And you only have God. And that's all that's going to get you through. That's all that's going to get you food. That's all that's going to get you through the next payment that you have. But this is where this woman has learned. She is not new to this sort of, of need. But she needs to be under 60, the wife of, a, of one man. Good report of her works. She's brought up children. She has lodged strangers. She knows hospitality to invite people into her home, to take care of those that need help. And this was a life that she learned all along the way as she sought to honor God. She washed the feet of the saints doing the servant's work, all those dusty feet that came in. And she relieved the afflicted. Sounds kind of like she was a, a Mother Teresa of sorts, this widow. And she diligently followed every good work. I'm sure she, that she knew those promises that said, be careful to entertain strangers, for in doing so, some have entertained angels. I'm sure she remembered those promises that to honor your mother and your father, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God gives you. And so these were the things that this widow did in her lifetime. And now that she has done her season, and she is needing the help, that only God can provide. He says, I put the lonely in family. I'm here to take care of you. You have done your service during your life. Let us continue now to repay you in the service that you have done for others by caring for you. The other younger widows didn't quite make that cut. They said they were wanton against Christ. So that's more that sensual desire. And they have a desire to marry. And neither of those obviously are a bad thing within the proper context. But in this situation, it lets us know that that desire caused them to leave their first faith. Their first faith in God. And as it goes on to describe their behavior, it is, um, in, the, in the Greek, it's a, a simultaneous action. They are leaving their first faith to pursue these other things. And at the same time, it says in verse 13, um, they have learned to be idle and wandering about from house to house and gossip and busybody, saying things they should not. So we have this comparison of one that is serving, one that is taking care of others, and one that is not and just going around idle, rejecting the faith, and just wandering, not being constructive in their community. And so the solution that Paul gives for these widows, for whatever reason that they're widows, because it sounds like they don't have children yet, he says, you need to get married, you need to have children, you need to learn to manage a house, and don't give opportunity uh, for the adversary to speak reproachfully. So learning to serve, you need to learn how to serve again in another capacity, and so that you can be constructive, so you can be productive, and that Satan cannot um, speak reproachfully or anybody else. It said that some have already turned after Satan. How many of you have ever been a caregiver yet? Are there parents, caregivers? Hands? It takes a lot of work, doesn't it? Parenting is a lot of work. Caregiving is a lot of work. I remember um, when I was graduating with my um, undergrad in theology degree, and I knew that God was leading me to England to take care of my grandma. And the, the, the um, Christmas break before I 
was graduating, I, I went there to you know, test it out for three weeks to see how things would work out and what I might need to do in order to prepare. And just praying and praying, God, is this what you want? Like, how is this going to work out? And the scriptures that I opened to that morning before I was leaving, just praying for confirmation, was this very one that we read for scripture today about needing to take care of your own household. It seems like an obvious thing. Um, but as a 25-year-old at the time, I was just like, okay, well, just confirm this. Because the parents were like, no, she needs to move over here with us. I'm like, she's 92. She does not want to. She's lived her whole life here in England. And I knew that he was leading me over there. And so the other scripture was from the book of James where it just says, to take care of widows and orphans is pure religion. Pure religion. And so I was like, well, Grandma qualifies for both of those. She's family. She's a widow, and she follows this list in Timothy of how she has lived her life to care for others and help others um, ever since she became a Christian from an atheist. And, and so, but it was such an interesting thing, and I just say that, is, is I was going shopping to buy some things before I was going to go to England, because it's cheaper to buy clothes and shoes over here than it is in England. And I was trying on a pair of shoes, so I was looking for some flats. And every one of them was not comfortable. I was having some sciatica pain from overlifting at my previous job in my stubbornness of being like, I can do what any guy can do. I can do it by myself too often. So I was reaping the results of my stubbornness. And, um, and as I tried on these pair of shoes, nothing was working. Everything was causing pain um, because I needed to go to the chiropractor and get some physical therapy done. But finally, the, the saleswoman brought out this pair of shoes, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful or anything, but when I saw them, there's a simple black shoe that specific shape, and I was like, that is not a cute shoe. That looks like an old lady shoe. I don't want to wear it. But I didn't want to offend the lady, so I tried it on anyways, and it felt so good. But it was so not cute, and I could not wear it. But in that moment, the Lord spoke to me, and he just said, Dana, this time over in England, you may not like how it looks, but it's going to be good for you. And so just knowing that and knowing some other things he'd already put in my past seven months before that I was worried about, um, I still went. And so just learning that relationship of how do you take care of, you know, being that caregiver. And for anyone, this is widow, so most people are going to be younger than them. But just learning how to navigate those that communication to be like, well, I'm the caregiver. And I feel like I'm a single parent right now, just having to work and come home, take care of the house, take care of the bills, take care of the yard, take grandma to doctor's appointment, be involved with church. Just a busy, full life. And at the same time, watching in 2007, 2008, 2008, 2000, yeah, around those periods, just the world collapse with the recession. And England being one of the hardest hit countries and just seeing... Um, I've never seen riots before in the streets. I'm watching riots in the streets. I'm watching houses go up for sale left, right, and everywhere, and they're not being able to be purchased. And I'm watching um, just stress on people's face, on the different um, nationalities that are there, just wondering what the future of, of England and what the world is going to hold for us as, as we continue to battle these different things. And um, and just watching the headlines in the newspaper, which were so much more blatant over there about new world orders and, and unification of this and that, and Catholics coming together with these leaders and breaches and schisms, and studying Bible prophecy more at that time, reading Great Controversy, and, and all these things. And God's like, I want you to go door to door. And I was just like, you know, Muslim atheist community. And, and I'm there just feeling like, God, how am I now trying to navigate so many roles and take care of my grandma at the same time? And she was awesome because, I mean, she was 92 and she could still, we'd still go down, catch the bus downtown and she'd go feed the pigeons and, and um, walk around the shops and go down to her hairdresser and come back up. But it's a very active 92-year-old. But still just learning how to navigate those relationships and expectations and, and, um, and it, and it was really challenging for both of us, uh, like any relationship when you merge it and um, with a, that huge age gap also. And I just remember there were many times I would cry out to God and in the challenges that we were facing, um, just trying to navigate that together at times. And, and, it, and it just seemed like there was, 
I don't, I don't know. It, it was just hard, is all I could say. But having to trust that Jesus knows the best way for us, Jesus knows the best way for our lives, and, and the way that our religion is really shown is, is, is when we take those hard steps, when we, when we take those relationships that he's given us and do the best that we can to care. And, and I, I honestly left there feeling so broken. I mean, my grandma had to come to America. We came over for my brother's graduation, and she had a TIA and then a stroke um, two weeks later. And she couldn't move back over, so I had to go back over and help um, pack up everything, finish up work. And, and I remember getting on the flight and just crying and just saying, Jesus, this hurt. Like, I felt like you brought me here. I learned a lot. I learned to discern God's voice even more and act on it like a minute man. And, and, but it, but it, it hurt. And I just said, I just feel like you brought me here and it utterly broke me. I just feel so broken. And the story that God brought to me as I opened up a book on the flight is from Everyday Religion. And it just talked about how it gave the analogy of how when there's um, a bunch of birds in a cage, like none of them can really truly learn the song that the master's trying to teach because they each have competing voices for it. But when you just have one bird in a cage and it's covered completely and they can't see anything, but they're just straining to listen to that voice, that song that the master's trying to teach them that slowly and slowly they'll learn the master's song, their individual unique song that they're supposed to sing. And when the cover is off, then they can sing it completely. And I felt like Jesus was just like, this may have felt like a darker time and a harder time, but you are learning to walk in the ways that I have asked you to. And so, so for anyone that's been a caregiver, for anyone who, who goes through those tasks that are longer than the 19 months I did it, they're hard calls, but, but again, these are God just being like, I've entrusted this and they've served me. Continue to serve them. Continue to care. And, and as I looked at this, this week I was reading about Esau and Jacob because it just seemed to parallel the, the, those who lived, these widows that lived for something that was greater. The widows that spent their life for others. Um, versus those who lived for the moment, those who lived for the day, those that were living for the here and now. And so looking at um, Jacob and Esau, the firstborn was given the birthright. And the birthright included not only the wealth of the family, but it included the spiritual inheritance of the family. And so with that spiritual inheritance in this particular lineage with Jacob and Esau, they knew that whoever would receive this, the Christ would come through this line. Esau lived short-sighted. He lived for the present moment. He had no interest in spiritual things, no love for devotion. He loved the adventures of the mountains. He loved going hunting. He loved coming back and telling his father all his wild adventures that he had been on. Um, and he, he just loved the feeling of power and revelry and feasting and just unrestrained freedom. He was so self-indulgent. But then you had Jacob, who, who longed for the promise of the Messiah. He wanted that to be his heritage in that line. He knew that that had been promised to him. He wanted to commune with God like Abraham. He wanted to offer sacrifices for the family's sins. And he gave his attentions and his affections and his care to his mother regularly and often, rather than Esau, who just did it every now and again. Um, and so when the, that moment came for Jacob, who thought he needed to navigate his own way of handling the reception of the birthright came about. And Esau was thinking, if I'm dead anyways, what good is this birthright? Give me this food right now. I want it. And you can have this birthright. I don't care about it. And so it's bartered away. His eternal, his spiritual heritage is bartered away. And when this came about later, when when Isaac came to lay hands on Esau and try and give him um, something, and Jacob came in and snuck that away also, it was then in that moment that Esau could see that he had lost it. And it could not be recovered, this spiritual inheritance. And his tears, even if they were tears, um, the spirit of prophecy just lets us know that he did not care about that spiritual inheritance. He was only concerned about the wealth. And he didn't, it, he was not repentant for his sin. He didn't care about the sin. 
He did not want to be reconciled to God. And so that's why the Bible calls him a profane man. He did not want anything to do with that, but he did want um, he did want the wealth and all that that went along with it. And, and how often it is, and how many Christians today, or how many of us today, could be thinking, I just want to do what I want. I just want to throw off restraint. I want to live for myself. I don't want to live in these ways that seem more straight in the scriptures. But at that time, we are missing out the training that God has for us. The steps that he is leading us on, however difficult they may seem, um, to build into us what he has for next for us, for those steps into the heavenly kingdom. And Esau was absolutely ready to sacrifice the heavenly for the earthly. But Jacob won that promise of the eternal. In Timothy, as, he, as Paul continues in verse 17, after he's let these, these women know, you need to live for the eternal. You need to train yourself in better ways than what you're doing. And um, it says, talks about the elders and gives some more insights to the elders who were to rule over or to take care of these, these ladies um, who are in need. In verse 17, it just says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. And there, it's in, in the word for labor, it's those, who, they're exhausting themselves, taking care of the women and preaching the word. And that double duty that they're trying to do, just utterly pouring themselves out. And, and so the Bible is letting us know, as it quotes from the Old Testament, like they're worthy, they're living worthy lives. It says, don't muzzle an ox while it treads the grain. The laborer is worthy of his wages. They are worthy. Then it gives some more advice, and it says, you know, don't receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also fear. I think in the Old Testament, so sometimes it can seem like the, some of the strategies of God may be harsh. But he was really trying to nip sin in the bud, like then just... And here again, Paul is giving those same commands as the old, repeating Old Testament commands. You know, if, if something is coming up against an elder, you need two or three witnesses that can testify against it in order for it to be legit. And for those who are sinning in leadership, they need to be, it needs to be presented to all so that, so that not only the leadership, it may be exposed as a sinful, but so that those in the church may see that this is not a way that we are to act or present ourselves or to carry on. Um, for God. So, so then Paul's final charges as he moves on, he says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice. Do nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in people's sins. Keep yourself pure. As the Bible tells us, without holiness, none shall see him. As he gives his final instructions for his ailments that he's experiencing. He tells Timothy also, take care of yourself. <laughs> take care of yourself. Don't just drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. And, and whether this wine or whatever the water he's drinking is not good for him or, um, or the wine is uh, fermented or unfermented, if it was fermented, even then the juice would dilute it to like a fourth. Um, for usage, but it reminds me here of something that Ellen White said, so much of the Bible otherwise, would say otherwise about anything that contains anything regarding alcohol for us um, that's unhealthful. But she, she was instructing somebody that was sick in, in her writings and just said, you know, every day just take a raw egg and grape juice and, there, and drink it. To me that doesn't sound good, but she said there's lots of nutrition in it and it will help you. So I imagine that sim somewhere along the same lines as Paul talking to Timothy about his ailments. You know, take this in, it will help you. And in review of the chapter, just looking at those, the sins that it's talked about and, and those that it's warning us against, it just says some men's sins are clearly obvious and those precede them to the judgment. Like, you already know what way it's going, but those some of some men follow later, later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident and those otherwise cannot be hidden. Um, all of our works are exposed. And so God's, Paul's instructions to Timothy again are, as he's navigating the church, is to discern between 
that which is good, that which is building up, those who are laboring for the kingdom and those who are hindering it and how to mobilize them um, in fruitful ways here. And, and the insight is to take care of our own house um, so that we don't deny the faith and be worse than an unbeliever. To deny that faith, um, as he just looks here, is because when we say that we're following God and and not taking care of our own, he says that's a that's a double whammy because even secular culture can sit here and be like, well, obviously you need to take care of your family, obviously. But then when we have the addition of the Word of God instructing us and commanding these things to how to take care of one another, he says if you're not listening to either, then you are you're just not you're just not being a faithful witness. Um, and so. So God's instructions for us and how to care for that which he cares about. And uh, this is kind of a transition close, but um, this last Sabbath, previous Sabbath, and Stephen was here preaching, and uh, we were having an evangelism event out at the fair and uh, for our preppers, PK preppers. You might have noticed it in the bulletin. Uh, just needing volunteers, and I was so thankful for each of the elders that came out and filled a two-hour slot to help talk with people that may be interested in Bible studies or in spiritual things. But we're out there passing out literature about um, health and different magazines on health and what the Bible says about health, but also Steps to Christ and um, great, great Controversy, the book of Noah, a Storm is Coming, giving Bibles out for free. And, and one man came up to me uh, when I was there, and and he just looked at me and he said, you guys are giving out Bibles for free? Because ours was the only free table. Everybody else there, I mean, people are preparing for the end times. This is what it is. So whether it may be doomsday extremists or other Christian vendors that are saying, Jesus is coming soon. We need to prepare for whatever is about to hit this earth. And so whether that is buying guns or having bulletproof vests or, you know, survival tents and gear and or getting your heirloom, non-Monsanto saturated seeds, um, you know, so you can have healthy food, or knowing how to filter your water, and knowing how to um, use essential oils for health, or freeze dry your food, and get bags of Mylar bags that can, you know, preserve your food for 25 years, and, and so all these different things that people that are Christian in the world are looking at about how do we prepare, how do we take care of ourselves now, um, how do we share this with others so that they can take care of their families also? Um, and this man came up to me, and again, he just said, you guys are handing out Bibles? And what came out was, well, yes, sir, because the Word of God says that in the last days there will be a famine for the Word of God. And people need to know now the Word of God and, and the truths that are in it. And so as I, as I listened to this person... Um, I, I just asked him and, and let him know, um, well, I just asked what interested him in, in that event, and he just said to me, he's like, well, you know, um, he works for the government, and, and he's like, I just know what's going on on that level, and so I just wanted to hear what was going on on this level, and so I said, okay, I, we all are in different spheres of environments and hear different things are attracted to different types of information so I'm always interested in listening to what, what is circulating out there because I know Bible prophecy I know what um, spirit of prophecy says to us about the last days and how we need to prepare so to hear it from this level and I just said well if I could have a microphone and give it to you what would you say to us at this level so that we could hear it and he looked at me and squinted his eyes a bit and he just said well you know I think that within the next three to five years we're going to have a water shortage in our cities and that we need to know, people need to know how to filter their water. They need to know where fresh water sources are because we're city dependent. And he's like, when, when that water goes, he's like, that's the fastest thing that people die from is lack of water or unsanitized water or not safe water sources. And, and so as I was listening to it, him, I was remembering in architecture, um, from when I was studying architecture and just the comments of, in our national conventions about how just trying to move everything more into the cities. Um, the education system, transportation, whatever it is, just to bring the people into the cities and build up the cities. But, but the light that we've been given for the end times is that there will be a time, as Sergio read earlier, we're going to have to leave the cities. We're going to have to leave everything um, that we have. And so talking with this man, 
um, listening to what his perspective is on, on the times and how he's preparing for it. And, and his wife was there and she just said, um, oh, you guys are Seventh-day Adventists? I'm like, yeah, we are. She's like, I just wrote an article about you. And she said that, um, she's like, you guys are in the blue zone. You have the longest living people groups. And we're like, yeah. And these insights are here in our magazines here. And, and so that opened up the, her husband's heart a little bit more to give him a great controversy and just let him know, sir, these things are coming. Whether you're religious or not, there are things that are coming and this book will let you know how to prepare for it and for your loved ones. And, and so just looking at even that, as we look at what Timoth Paul has said to Timothy about how we need to take care of one another, looking at how do we take care of one another as a church as we continue to move forward, how do we look out for ourselves and the life that God has given us. And so I was really glad that all the elders could be there to hear some of the talk and, and see what's, what other Christians are doing, believing that Christ is coming, um, Christ is coming soon, and how we need to consider um, how to move forward for preparations for those things according to the life that we've been given also. And, and that is, again, just looking at how, how God is wanting to use each one of us to manage his body. And, and there were a few other divine appointments that were just beautiful. Because I know I, I prayed and everyone else was praying for people that would come past um, and that we could give literature to. Just I usually pray, I'm like, God, prepare people's hearts ahead of time. Prepare them so that when they come to this table, it's just an answer to prayer and they recognize it. And there was one couple that came by and we stopped and chatted with them. And, after a while, he saw the book, The Great Controversy, and let him have that for free, and he's like, you know, we were just talking about this stuff on the way here. And I was like, well, what stuff? He's like, well, this stuff, how we, how we need help, and how we, and he's like, and I've heard of this book before a few times. I need this book now. And, and another lady that came by, she's like, you guys are giving that for free? She's like, my friend is reading that book right now, and she said she'd give it to me when I was, she was done, but you're giving it to me for free now? And so just the blessings of being able to incorporate in the larger sphere of just taking care of the larger sphere that God has given, pointing people to that which is eternal, just like the widows, laboring for that which is eternal, rather than that which is temporary and will not last. Even if it looks fun, there are training tools that God is trying to put in our life and in our path um, in order to prepare us for that eternal inheritance that we pray is coming. I'm going to invite you guys to join for our closing song. It's Bind Us Together. And I'll invite you to stand because I just like standing.
Thank you for your power, Lord, that your face would shine upon 